My next use case is around ecosystem integration. Uh, my name is James Holden. I'm the Senior Product Manager for On Command Insight. I'm going to give you some details about how we're using the wealth of data that we've got within On Command Insight to feed to other tool sets within an organization. So the goal is, uh, from an end user perspective, they want to be able to connect that data into the wider ecosystem. They want to take all the operational wealthy data that we've got and the business data that we've added to it and feed it to things like the billing systems, automation programs. Um, the challenge is there's all these different siloed tool sets out there. They've all got their own little unique ways of wanting to see the data, to splice it and dice it. Um, manually feeding that data in is very, very error prone. Um, it's also very labor intensive and very time consuming. <coughs> so we've got a multitude of different ways that we can feed that data. Um, we've got the REST API, which um, really does help expose that to the wider organization. It's fully documented, all the little gets, the puts, the posts, the deletes, they're all there. We've even got examples and try it before you use it in our um, Swagger functionality and I'll jump into that in a, in a second. But the, the end goal is then feeding into these other systems. So one of the most popular use cases is around integration with ServiceNow. Um, everyone's heard of the ServiceNow CMDB. Um, it's one of the kind of biggest and best IT service management and ticketing systems out there. But it's got a, it suffers from one little um, constraint, which is limited visibility and understanding of the other IT infrastructure components. Um, ServiceNow, like it shows on the chart here, uses flex balls and LUNs and puts them in the same service class. It's not got a differentiation of those. For, so troubleshooting <coughs> an environment with it, it isn't really as, as easy as it could be. And looking at using the discovery modules within ServiceNow, um, they're not very timely. They're also a cost component to those. On Command Insight is gathering all this data. It's got the humongous details of every little nuance for how those attributes are pulled together, how they're interconnected. And we can feed that data straight into ServiceNow. So with all the capacity information, really making the accuracy of the ServiceNow CMDB far greater than it's ever been before. So the way we do it, um, we create that centralized view um, to really help mitigate the risk and the, the change impact from the storage constructs. And here's my chart of ServiceNow without an OCI in the environment. And this is how it looks. You've got your application, you've got your different Linux servers, um, but there's no underlying service constructs in that picture. We have all those end-to-end -end relationships. So taking the feed of OCI from that Linux service perspective, what I can now build out is a picture that looks like this. And this is out of the box with On Command Insight. There's a, a connector it's up on the automation store that anyone can pull in. And what we now see is these servers are then interconnected with these different storage servers. So when there is a troubleshooting workflow, when someone's doing a change in the environment and they want to know what's impacting, what's interconnected against each other, um, they can look in the service now and they've got an accurate record of truth and so know it's accurate. This data flows out of OCI and into service now. And it, yes. And not only are we pulling in the devices, the, store, the servers and the storage servers in the service now perspective, but we're also taking across the OCI URL. Every um, landing page, like the VM landing page I was previously showing in the monitoring and troubleshooting um, example, it is unique. So as we brought that across, we've now got the storage server, URL, the ticketing person, the help desk operative, when they're going to service now to look at what the issues is, you can just jump straight into OCI, see if there's any performance policies that have been breached on it, see if there's a performance issue, they can pass it to the right person and they can get to the troubleshooting as quick as possible. Yes. Um, here's a little quick overview of actually how this works. So it's actually been done by a Python script that's calling and getting the data from OCI doing a post into the um, import API service now. And we're also pulling that data back to then put an accurate record of truth back into OCI as well. It's a two-way handshake in this game. So we pull in all the relationships. We pull in that, the storage service to the underlying um, um, servers. We're adding the missing relationships. We're adding the URLs. And then we're noting any changes back into the system as well. And we do this via 
a REST API, and I'll, I'll quickly show you my REST API and how that looks. All right, so this is, again, NetApp IT environment. I log in with a single sign-on. I come over here. I've got all my help. I've got my support matrix. If anyone's any interested in looking at all the different data sources and the different devices we're collecting information on, um, I've also got my REST API documentation. And here's my full uh, swagger with all my different calls in the environment. So if I wanted to look at my queue trees and I wanted to look at um, just doing a pull of all that information, here's my uh, details. I can try it out if I had an ID. Let's just randomly drop an ID in there. Um, I can do so. Okay, so any questions on any of the ecosystem integration? So what are the most popular? Uh, ServiceNow is hugely popular. Um, being the data into um, NetApp WFA is very popular. BMC Atrium, highly popular. Um, uh, in-house tool sets is the other one. Um, large organizations often have got very popular with ITIL back in the early 2000s. They built themselves huge. <laughs> Howard's shaking his head. <laughs> so, it's a four-letter word. CMDD, CMDBs, and they've used them ever since. So they want to be able to maintain those constructs. And so um, feeding that data into those CMDBs, uh, they had armies of staff that did it. When they get OCI, it's now a, a case of someone's wrote a script and it's just feeding that data across. What are the most complex? Um, those in-house CMDBs. Mm. Yeah, because no like say, they built them back in the 2000s and they were trying something that was cutting edge at the time and they wanted to gather as much information as they possibly could. Whereas so there's an oracle form for everything. <laughs> You're lucky if you've got an oracle form. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So uh, those are the, the real complex ones. And especially when they go across geographies as well. And when there's uh, differentiation between the two. So they've diverged somewhere along so, the line. So there's the same table. There's, there's, there's the same data in a table for the US and in a table for France. But the like field it. names are all in French, so you can't correlate them. <laughs> and they're not necessarily a one to one relationship between the fields. Yes. Or it could be COBOL dumps. You're giving me Inevitable. flashbacks, James. <laughs> it was the good old days. What are the characteristics of the companies that are the most successful with operationalizing OCI, like getting the most value from it? Hmm. Like what would be the, the recipe, the ingredients for success, in your opinion? Um, so it's often with the case, it's the amount of effort you put in mm. is the amount of um, value you, you get out of the system. Um, having uh, resources that are, are trained on using OCI, um, exposing that knowledge to the wider organization and kind of publicizing their in-house usage of OCI, those are then when it starts to become successful. It's, it doesn't take much for it to become sticky in an organization and, and people um, reliant on the data sets. Um, the more people know about their reliance on those data sets, the more it becomes successful. And the more then use cases that you can see. As, as you probably grasped, there's a lot of different use cases you can get with OCI, from the reporting side to the cost control to the, the monitoring of environments. And when it does get that full exposure, those are when it starts getting really successful mm. and becomes a, a key component within their IT organization. So when, so when you have a, a, a new customer that comes on board, um, so they're going to be relying heavily on professional services from NetApp? Not, not necessarily. Not necessarily? Not necessarily. To uh, stand it up and start operationalizing it? Um, Often it helps because there's a familiarity that you yeah. need to have with the tool sets, but it's not every organization that needs that. And what about the training? So I've got an engineer who's going to be the OCI guy. Um, how long does it normally take for an engineer to become um, 
operationally and administratively um, an expert with, with the OCI ecos ecosystem? Um, it's like a couple of months, a couple of weeks, day and a half. It really depends on the complexity of their, their infrastructure in mm. the first place um, and how, how much of an environment they need to build. Like, the benefit of being in the OCI person, I don't recommend it's just one person in an organization. Um, it, that knowledge needs to be shared and it, it doesn't need to be a full-time person. It can be people look into the OCI and they can... But, but I do need an SME. You need someone, and then, you need people to care and feed the tool set and make yep. sure that it's collecting the data. Because then if it doesn't collect the data, it's not going to be the accurate record of truth. Um, and nice. on a large organization, change occurs. Storage devices get removed from the infrastructure and new ones get put in. Keeping that up to date. Um, it's a very simple process to add new data collectors into the environment and start pulling data from a, a device. But it needs people to make it part of the daily process. And it really is more about being part of the process rather than it needs the guy to do it. Um, but a couple of weeks, you've got very familiar, and a lot of people are creating very nice dashboards within a mm. couple of weeks in the operational side of the house. Yep. The reporting side, that's, that's normally a little bit of a different mindset. It normally needs a, more of a kind of a, a business analyst perspective on the world. Um, the automation store is really helping with answering a lot of those questions because they can now just download a report and ingest it into their system and they're up and running. But um, often we see that uh, PS come in to help with that customization. And it, then it is really customization. So on NetApp University, are there, are there courses <coughs> for on-demand insight? Okay. Yes. There's a, a variety of courses from the operational side of the house to the business reporting to generalist courses to... Uh, and typically anybody who got who purchased On Human Insight, they already have at least some NetApp. Um, possibly, yeah, not always the case. Sometimes there is, oh, the only NetApp that these customers have is On Command Insight. Okay. 